God doesn't play favorites. He's created all of man in his glorious image, uh, and we are one before, before him. God does not play favorites. Let me introduce the message with this excerpt from a book by Mark McMinn. It's, the book is titled, Why Sin Matters. Mark McMinn says, when we see ourselves as pretty good, we misunderstand the gravity of sin and our desperate need for grace. We place ourselves above others, become their judges, and give them the power to disappoint us. McMinn says a physicist friend uses this analogy. Each of us is like a light bulb. One shines with 50 watts of holiness. Another has only 25 watts. Maybe the most stellar Christians are 200 watts. But these comparisons become trite in the presence of the sun. In the face of God, our different levels of piety are puny and meaningless. It makes no sense to compare ourselves with one another because we are all much more alike than we are different. James is trying to get that truth across in these verses in James chapter 2, uh, 1 and following. I'd like us just to focus on the first four verses today as we take baby steps through James, you're thinking. Uh, but a very important passage. He's talking about distinctions in the area of wealth. Uh, and evidently there were some in James' day that would welcome the man wearing gold rings on his fingers and wearing elegant clothing. That rich man would be given by the deacons who were seating them a special place of honor in the assembly of the believers. And James gives the illustration of a poor man coming into the same assembly dressed poorly in clothes that are worn out and probably smelly as well giving that poor person a place of humble uh, position in the assembly of the believers, seated at the footstool or by the footstool of someone else. Uh, we are not to have that kind of distinction among us uh, in the assembly of God's people. Really as light bulbs, whether we shine as 50 watts or 100 watts or 200 watts in our Christian lives, we have no reason to compare ourselves with anyone else as we think of the Son, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we have no reason to compare ourselves with one another. Let's notice James' words in these first four verses. This is taken from the New American Standard translation. James says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Please note, dear friends, that showing favoritism contradicts the character of God. Favoritism and our God do not go together. Our God does not show favoritism. Notice that our glorious Lord is completely impartial. Notice again verse 1 of chapter 2. 
My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Our Lord is impartial. He does not look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. James again uses this familiar phrase, my brethren, and it's a phrase of love and familiarity with his brothers and sisters in Christ. My brethren, and that term brethren or brothers speaks of unity, that we're all one in the Lord Jesus Christ, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember what the Apostle Paul said about distinctions in Galatians 3.28? You might want to write down this reference, Galatians 3.28, where Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What a powerful statement. It's our heavenly position that is important and not our financial condition as we think of these four verses. Do you remember what James has already said in chapter 1, verses 9 through 11? Look back at chapter 1, 9 through 11. James says, but the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. If this brother in humble circumstances knows the Lord Jesus Christ, he has all of eternity ahead of him. He has the glorious presence of the Lord forever and ever. He has a high position. Notice verse 10 in chapter 1. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because like flowering grass he will pass away even though he might have all the wealth imaginable, his life has a beginning and an ending here on earth. And one day he will pass from this life into the next. And that wealth will not do a thing for his eternal destiny. Verse 11 of chapter 1, For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed, so too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. We need to imitate our glorious Lord, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, who's mentioned here in chapter 2, verse 1. What a, what a recognition of who he is with this statement our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. James is speaking of his kingly majesty in verse 1. He's speaking of the fact that the Lord Jesus is absolutely perfect in his character, in his excellencies. He is our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And as our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, he is completely without partiality. Do you remember Paul's words in Romans chapter 2, verses 9 through 11? Another reference to jot down. Romans 2, 9 through 11. Paul says, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And verse 11 is a key verse, for there is no partiality with God. It all boils down to my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. What is that relationship like? Do I know him personally? Uh, that is my question to each of you today. Do you have a personal relationship with our glorious Lord Jesus Christ by faith? Have you asked him to be your savior? There's no partiality with God. We are all saved by our faith. Not by our works, not by our worldly status, not by the amount in our bank account. 
We're saved by the free gift offered to us through the finished work of Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Do you know those verses well? (laughs) They are verses that we should know. We're saved by grace and not by works. The works follow our salvation, but we're not saved by our works. Our glorious Lord Jesus Christ does not have an attitude of personal favoritism. Personal favoritism is an idiom in the Greek New Testament in which the New Testament was originally written. Personal favoritism literally says in the Greek New Testament to accept someone's face. It means to make distinctions between people Uh, by treating one better than another uh, by an outward observation. Personal favoritism is literally to accept someone's face and on the other hand to reject someone else's face. It's to show favoritism. James says that this is a sin. Turn over to James chapter 2 and verse 9. Just flip the page if you have to. James 2, verse 9. James says, but if you show partiality, if you're one of these people that accepts a particular face and not another, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And then flip another page, if that your Bible requires you to do that, to James chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. James chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. He says, But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. Our glorious Lord Jesus Christ does not show favoritism in his dealings with men and women. He does not look at the outward appearance, but looks at the heart. We need to remember our theme statement. Showing favoritism contradicts, goes against God's character. In verses uh, 2 and 3, notice that our glorious Lord disregards outward appearance. Partiality is out of place in our church gatherings. Notice again verse 2. James says, For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, verse 3, and you pay attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, You sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, You stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Partiality is out of place in the assembly of God's people. James is illustrating that partiality, what it looks like in the assembly. The word assembly in the Greek New Testament is the word that we get synagogue from. Uh, Remember James is writing early on to the early Christian church the, many of the believers that he's writing to have a Jewish background. So this term synagogue, which means assembly, is a word that he uses uh, in writing to these many of them Jewish men and women who have come to faith in Christ. So this is a meaningful term, and it refers to an assembly of God's people. Uh, certainly the church gathered in this context in James chapter 2. So as we gather here from Sunday to Sunday, we're assembling ourselves together in the name of Christ. And how we receive people is so very vital, isn't it? Uh, We don't want to have any distinctions, uh, whether the person comes in finely dressed or poorly dressed and even maybe smelling. Uh, We accept them, we love them, because that's the character of our God who does not show personal favoritism, does not look at a person's outward appearance. James gives the illustration of a man entering with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes. It's probably not a single gold ring that James has in mind. 
Uh, many of the people, even the poorer people among them, would have probably had some kind of a ring on their finger. He's referring to the gold-ringed man, the man who's described by his gold rings. Uh, there, were, there were stories of some in James' day that had several rings on each finger, usually on the left hand. Uh, as that person came in with all of these rings and jewels, the temptation would be to set that person in a place of honor uh, in the assembly of God's people. James says that ought not to be. He's dressed in fine clothes. Literally, he's dressed in bright and shining clothes. He's used bleach on his white shirt. He stands out in a crowd by the wonderful suit of clothes he's wearing. He's glamorous and elegant. Uh, but all of this is just superficial. It's just the outward decor that attracts us in this case. And then on the other hand, the illustration continues with the poor man who comes into the assembly of God's people in dirty clothes. The poor man is literally one who's been reduced to begging. Perhaps the people in the assembly have seen this very poor man out on the street corner begging for a handout. We can identify with that a little bit if we drive into Bellingham. Some of the busy street corners, there are people with signs and wanting us to give them a handout and, and so on. Uh, what if that person that you recognize from seeing them on the street corner again and again would come into the assembly here? Our attitude should be one of welcoming and loving and offering freely the gift of Christ's love for him. This person perhaps is not only poor, but he has no influence. He has no position, no place of honor in the community. He comes in in dirty clothes, literally clothes that are filthy, the word implies in the Greek New Testament. Clothes that are shabby and grubby. He not only looks bad, but he smells bad. Perhaps you wouldn't want to sit by him. But as a member of the assembly, you would welcome this person in the poor clothing. And even though he might smell bad, please join us. Please sit by me. James points out in verse 3 that giving any special attention to the rich is really unthinking from a biblical point of view. James says, and you pay special attention. To pay special attention is literally to turn your eyes upon that rich person. To gaze upon them in a sense, with a sense of awe. Why would you come here? You're awed by their presence. You're having regard for them specially. You're looking up to them. To the one who comes in wearing these elegant clothes. And you tell that person, or perhaps the deacons of the day, who ha often had the responsibility of seating people in the assembly, the deacon would perhaps take this wealthy person and s say, you sit here in a good place. That is a place that's important in our assembly. That is a place that's comfortable. It's a seat of honor. You know, here at Evergreen, the folks in the very last row are in the seats of honor. <laughs> you have to get here early for a back seat, right? These front seats are just dime a dozen. So this is where we're going to send the poor man right up front by Pastor Steve. Poor guy. James says this ought not to be how you treat people with distinctions. And then he goes on to say, you say to the poor man, you stand over there. This is standing room only for you. Or perhaps you say, sit down by my footstool. The footstool is a place uh, that is inferior to the regular seating. And literally it says, sit under 
or buy my footstool. They're not even offering them, him the footstool. They're offering him a place on the floor uh, by the footstool, probably. James makes a strong illustration. I don't have to remind us that it's human nature. It is really who we are, basically, to want to judge by outward appearance. Can you identify with that? It comes naturally to us, doesn't it? To look at someone on the outward appearance and want to make some judgments about that person. With the Lord's help, we need to see others as he sees them. It's a supernatural help that we need here. With his help, we need to see others as the Lord sees them. Every person is created in his image. Every person has the potential to bring glory to our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, dear friends, showing favoritism contradicts God's character. And then finally, from verse 4, Notice that our glorious Lord is the judge of all people. He hasn't given us that job. Verse 4 says, Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Have you not made distinctions among yourselves? Have you not become a judge pointing out the difference between the rich and the poor. The Jewish believers had trouble because of their wanting to make distinctions between Jewish believers and Gentile believers. In the book of Acts, that was dealt with by the council in Jerusalem, uh, wanting to accept the Gentile believers even as the Jewish believers had been accepted by the Lord. And in Acts 15, verses 6 through 11, uh, the, the, the conclusion is that the Gentile believers are just as we are as Jewish believers. They are loved by the Lord. They are saved by His grace. They do not have to do all of the practices that we're used to as Jewish people with circumcision and so on. Uh, we need to accept them as the Lord accepts them. We're not to, to make distinguish, to distinctions based on outward appearance. Dear friends, we must avoid becoming judges. Remember, God is the judge. 2 Timothy 4.8, Paul says it clearly. Uh, In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also who have all who have loved his appearing. Notice what James says over in chapter 4, verse 11. James 4, 11. He says, Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. And then in the last chapter of James, chapter 5, verse 9, James says, Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. So... My brothers and sisters, our job is not to judge others by their outward appearance, to consider their face. Our job is to judge ourselves by looking into the mirror of God's word and not turning away from it immediately and forgetting what we see. We're to look into the mirror of God's word, see what needs to be done to our appearance and act appropriately in response to what God's word says. Changing ourselves by doing the word. Showing favoritism contradicts God's character. I'd like to make a couple applications which we should do when we come to the word always. 
This week, I hope you'll think about your own life. Ask the question, how do I treat others? Do I consider their face? Do I judge them on their outward appearance? Remember that the way we behave toward people reveals what we really believe about God. How I treat others is really what I believe about God. Confess any kind of judgmental spirit that maybe has plagued you. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then another application would be to practice thinking and praying about the potential in others. Not looking at their face in the present tense in judgment, but thinking of them in their potential. I believe that's what Jesus did. For instance, Jesus saw the potential in the lives of sinners. When he looked at Simon Peter, in all of his flaws, he saw ultimately a rock foundational to the church of Christ. When he saw the tax collector Matthew making money uh, uh, for the Romans, Jesus saw a faithful disciple who would write one of the Gospels in the New Testament. When he came to the woman at the well, he saw someone not only who'd been married five times and was living with another, but he saw a woman transformed by the grace that he would offer her, who would be a powerful witness to her community, and many would be touched through her life. We need to practice thinking and praying about the potential in the people around us. What could God do with this person's life no matter what they appear to be today, how could they be changed to the glory of God? Think of them in the case, in in thinking of their potential. John Wesley was a humble man used greatly of God. And he, by his life, witnessed to the holy love of God throughout his life, and even in death, John Wesley was a man who had preached more than 45,000 sermons. I've just preached over 1,300, and you're saying, man, that seems like a lot to me. I've heard most of those, by the way. Some of you can say that. He preached more than 45,000 sermons. He traveled mostly on horseback, a distance equivalent to nine times around the world. That gives me saddle sores just thinking about it. He wrote 233 books and pamphlets and helped with the writing of a hundred more. But for Wesley, this was not enough. Even in death, he witnessed the love of God in his life. Among Wesley's funeral instructions was the request that his body be buried in nothing more costly than wool, No silk or satin was to adorn the corpse from which his spirit had fled. And his last will and testament gave final seal to the gospel uh, he had so long and courageously preached. He directed that, quote, whatever remains in my bureau and pockets at my decease was to be equally divided among four poor itinerant preachers. He specially requested that neither hearse nor coach take any part in his funeral, and he desired that six poor men in need of employment be given a pound each to carry his body to the grave. We're created in the image of God. None of us is more important than another in God's sight. Showing favoritism contradicts the character of our loving God.